On today's episode of an Echo of Glory, we look back at the Burnley win. We take a deep dive into the potential signing of Timo Werner with journalist Seb stafford Bloor, And we look ahead to Man United with Ian Irving from the Talk of the Devils podcast. But before that, here's a word from Jake Robson. Yes, it is awards season and we've been nominated, as we've told you plenty of times, at the Sports Podcast Awards for Best Team Podcast. So please go and vote for us. The link will be on the YouTube page and Johnny will uh, post it out again on Twitter, formerly known as X. No, it's X formerly known as Twitter, but we got there in the end. We've also got some merch that we're wearing and proudly showing off. So head over to our website. Again, that link will be on the Twitter and uh, YouTube pages. So go check those out as well. Welcome to another episode of Echo of Glory. I'm Johnny Blaine. This is Gary Diamond. Hello. And this is Marky Mark, aka <laughs> Jake Robson. Hello. Hello. Good day, Johnny. So far, so good. I've got me. I've dressed myself this morning, and I've got me Echo of Glory sweatshirt on. You're rocking the cap. Where can we buy them? Uh, you can buy I was, them. I, I, I mean, I was given this via the Launchpod Studios uh, merch site. I'll, I'll stick a link up again on our socials. And you can get some lovely Echo and Glory merch. Anything else to report? Yes. Uh-oh. <laughs> you. You've had a haircut. I went for a haircut this morning. Very nice. Too short? No, I think it's good. Thanks. Uh, fresh, sharp <laughs> trim. Speaking of haircuts, I, I did mean to <laughs> well, say... we're at it. <laughs> yeah, I did mean to say, um, how do you wear a cap? Mm. Take off your... Take it off, and, and your hair just doesn't move. It's still as perfect as it was when well, the cap went on. Since, just take your cap no, off. since I last so, saw you, I've off. also had a haircut. Look at that. We've yeah, he has had short. a haircut. Uh, yeah. 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 So, But, I mean, if I wear a cap, I'll just get my afro back when I take it off. Like, it's just, boom. <laughs> That's why I don't wear a cap. What, the, like the Alan Sugar style afro? Is that how <laughs> your hair goes? <laughs> Currently, we're talking. Yeah, not quite like that, because it's um, not, it's very nice receding it. somewhat. It's a, it's a good cap. I'm never going to wear yeah, it. But you, can go, you can go back. Oh, Marky Mark. <laughs> Although it's a bit, I need to tighten it for that. But no, look, it's nice. It's got green underneath. It's very, you never designed this. Hat on the back. Anyway, we also, we owe an apology, don't we? Uh, do, but, but do we? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know if we saved our listeners a story, but I realised last week we... Uh, we cut Johnny off mid-flow to talk about Tommy Mooney instead. Uh, it, it, wasn't, it was, was, it was pretty bad. What was that? Well, you, you were about to tell us about the time that your dad let you into the away end by yourself, age 13, versus Watford. This, oh, yeah. And, uh, and, 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 and Jake sort of mentioned, I think Tommy Mooney was in that game, and I got distracted and was much more interested in Jake's knowledge of that Watford team than you being in the away end on your well, own, age 13. When I was 13... So can, I, so can we please pick this up? Yeah, when I was 13, I was proper hard. And like <laughs> my dad was like... <laughs> You could go the way, you, <laughs> you're hard enough. So what happened? I just softened up as I got older. I had kids, you know, I mellowed a bit. And my Your dad, dad was, thought you'd be all right against the Watford Massive. <laughs> so I went Watford that, away. That three stretch will do it to you, will it? <laughs> <laughs> well, Watford away. Uh, let's not talk about getting arrested at football <laughs> matches. <laughs> wow, this wow. has taken a turn. Um, let's, let's move that, on. That's for another day. Uh, six for three no away, days, no days ever. Six, yeah, six three away uh, to Watford in the League Cup, 93-94. Jürgen Klinsmann, son of a baker. Son of a baker. Yes. Yeah. And oh, my, my dad was also in the way end, but it was much further. We took a really... So you weren't in the way end by yourself? No, I was. We took, so oh. this is a null and void story. No, this is why we interrupted <laughs> you. Because it's, it's just nonsense. <laughs> no, he was like right down the other end in the upper tier and I was like right down the other end in the lower tier. So I was on my own. How come though? I have no idea. You, hear, you used to hear stories like that when it was standing. You'd be like, oh yeah, and we, we got separated didn't watch the game together. But we, this is 1994. Yeah. Oh, well, what are you going to do? Oh, yeah, 94, 95. Your dad's kicked you. Your dad's, you your <laughs> dad's up in the, in the you posh seats and you're in the, he's put son Actually, in the cheap seats. you brought it up. We just ignored you and now I understand why <laughs> we ignored you. <laughs> okay. Very so, good. Do you want some club news? Let's do it. There isn't much. The 18s and 21s have not played this year. Uh, they will be back in league action this week. 21s against Southampton, 18s against Villa. Keep your eye on that. The women return to action this weekend against Sheffield United in the FA Cup. They've made a couple of signings. It is uh, transfer window open, of course. They've signed a Matilda Vinberg from Hammerby, who would have played under Robert Wilhelm at Hammerby, where he was manager. And a really good player, Australia international Charlotte Grant, who'd also been playing in Sweden, so the manager will know all about her. In terms of the men's team, it's been a busy week for the aggregators on social media. Obviously, the transfer window is open. That sets social media off into a frenzy. Uh, start with the outs. Ash Phillips. Sorry, Gary. 
has gone to, well, it bumps up Alfie Dorrington, has gone to uh, <laughs> Plymouth Argyle on loan. Good luck to him. And Josh Keeley, who I think is a goalkeeper, has gone to Barnet, which was a bit of an odd one because I don't think he's going to play. I often find that weird. I work a lot on National League, Lower League, and you see players come from bigger clubs on loan and they don't play. And you think, well, what's the, what was the point in this loan to not play? Um, well, I mean, I'm, we maybe didn't want to get into it, but Ash Phillips on the bench in the Premier League and he's, and he's not gone to the championship. He's gone to the league. No, they're in championship. No, they're in the championship. Plymouth in the championship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, they're, I, they're I promise, you, I promise bit, I work in football. <laughs> 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 no, I think, look, it's uh, my, my, my liking of Ash Phillips is, is just a preference of him to what else we had available. However, a loan for a kid to the championship in a team that defends a lot, plays usually in a four, sometimes in a five, Done some research. He's done more research than you. He knows what the yeah. vision is. Bloody hell! <laughs> they're, 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 they're down near the bottom, but they'll be all right. I think it's a good loan. It's, it's a good loan here. Get good experience, and, and it can only benefit. Um, and you know, we we get onto transfers later. I would not be surprised to see Dorrington go on loan. No, we're doing window. transfers now. Are we doing it now? Yeah. Okay. I would not be surprised to see Dorrington go on loan. And with the talk around uh, a certain Eric Dyer as well, it does seem to be the case, along with. Uh, uh, Poster Cogley's assertion last week that, you know, would we miss Eric Dyer? No. <laughs> it was pretty blunt, wasn't it? Yeah. So I think we can be pretty confident that we're going to bring somebody in. That somebody looks like Dragushin. I've been saying Dragushin all week, but um, apparently it's Dragushin. Okay. Um, the first Romanian centre back was signed since the wonderful. Vlad. Yeah. Mm. Kirikos. Oh, what a guy. Um, so hopefully it'll be better than that. But yeah, um, I think we're going to be stronger at centre-back, um, notwithstanding, we don't yet know the extent of Ben Davies' injury. Yeah, some, some talk that might have been a bad one. So we'll start with Dragushin. I have to, I think I said last week. What is there to say? Well, it, there's a lot if you follow us social media. It's on, well, it's There's it's a off. lot of bedwetting last night. Yeah, oh, oh, about, the, about the deal, I thought you were going to tell me about the player, because that's I all I care about. I don't know about the player. Exactly, like, that's what I'm saying. I, I, no one knows about him. Let's When he comes, we'll Like I said to you, I, I spoke to Patrick, and Patrick said, I'll be honest with you, I, I haven't seen him. Juve seem a little bit upset is the wrong word there's some rumblings that Juve maybe think they shouldn't have got rid of him I've spoken to a couple of unnamed Serie A commentators who I'm not going to throw under the bus who said similar I genuinely don't think I've seen enough of him to, to tell you about him uh, but genuinely having a half decent season um, I've done my YouTube research he looks okay fine but like you said Gary there was a lot of nonsense on social media the, the, there's also you know whenever we sign somebody like Van de Ven and you get all the usual how good can he be if nobody else wanted him you know as though like you know Spurs want him but nobody else it's got to be rubbish but actually who said that oh it happens all the time like, all we take too long to name names yeah we can't can't, uh, no, can't, let's, let's he, name can't he can't be any good <laughs> because nobody else wanted him that's why we managed to get him all this nonsense, but actually, you know, just like Van der Ven, just it, like Vicario, exactly. it, it definitely exactly. seems to be the case, just with, like Bissouma. But it definitely seems to be the case with this guy that, that Bayern Munich have an interest, whether that's game playing or not. Certainly, AC Milan had an interest, so you know, I don't think that, that accusation can be leveled. Juventus seem upset that uh, that they've let him go. Um, so this isn't one of those where whether you've seen him or not and you haven't heard of him, the reality is he's got clubs chasing him. I think the main frustration has been that it's the 9th of Jan and we still don't have a centre-half. And OK, we've got five days till our next game. You'd hope that we can get the deal done. But no one really knows what's going on. These deals take time. Just got to hope we've got someone in with, especially with Davies being out. Um, if Van der Ven is going to come back, OK, that softens it a little bit. But it'd be good to have a new centre-half in by Sunday. And, and, and for all the, oh, it takes a long time to get deals done, actually... By the end of tomorrow, if, if Dragushin signs, Spurs probably would have signed two players, mm. and I don't think any other Premier League club has signed one. And for all of the pay the money and all of this sort of chat, and this isn't me... No, no, go on. Spend the money, give us your... <laughs> pay the money, Levy! <laughs> and, and this, isn't, this isn't me, you know, I, I know a lot of people sort of go, oh, is this a Levy Love in podcast? No, it's not. We try to be sort of <laughs> level-headed, and we yeah. will... We will criticise the board when they when there's criticism to be had the, the, the ticket prices earlier on in the season and many other situations as well are, you know the, the appointments of managers and and, 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 and certain treatment of players where, where there's criticism to be had but actually the, a lot of the inactivity at this moment in time and this is a topic I think we're going to come on to and it's prevalent for this pod is the consequence of financial fair play and Spurs have I think it was Kieran Maguire wrote something actually today about the fact that he's Spurs, great on the finances he's mm. all over it saying that Spurs are in such a strong position with so much financial fair play headroom that does not mean that we have 400 million sat in the bank burning a hole in our pocket that's a very very different thing but we have so much financial fair play headroom 
which is the consequence of not having paid the money levy around all those years. And people will say, oh, but we might have missed out on trophies and this, that, the other. Coulda, woulda, shoulda, maybe. Don't know. I'm not justifying having missed out on certain players. But we are in a very strong position. And the more that financial fair play comes into effect and force, as we've seen with Everton and teams now nervous about losing 10 points, the more the market will become something that Tottenham can take advantage of and we are in a very, very strong position well, going forward. I look forward to the Tottenham Away TV guy popping up in our YouTube mentions. Oh. <laughs> he's been all over social media this week, giving his Let's sticking just, his orange. Just don't give him any. Just Has he yeah, yeah, yeah. He's been popping up. I it's think really he only pops been. up on yours. It's not really worth. The more you, the more you read his tweets, the more he'll pop up on yours. <laughs> the, That's the pro- how, that is actually how it works. Yeah, the problem is you have people with very fixed agendas, and again, this is something that we discuss with you know United fans, for example, but they may actually be justified. People have ideas in their heads. What we want to try to do is bring that middle ground of this is good, this is bad, this is good, this is bad. Mm. And we are in a very strong position through financial fair play. Whether you agree as to the means of how we've got there or yeah. not doesn't really matter. That's where we, we are. are now. And come tomorrow, we probably will have made two signings where no other Premier League club would have made well, one. the cheap git's gone and done a six-month loan because it's <laughs> uh, with a possible uh, loan to buy with Timo, uh, for Timo Werner. When you st- when you talk about Timo Werner, the moment you hear about Timo Werner, what do you think? You think, oh, wasted chances and poor spell at Chelsea. But actually, when you break it down, I think, or get your thoughts, I think it works for Tottenham right now. I think it works for Tottenham for the, the simple fact that he could make our team better. But if he doesn't, he, we're not bringing him in we're not in a state of crisis at the moment. He's not the answer. He's not being brought in as the answer to all our problems. So if he doesn't work, he just doesn't play and we carry on as we were. If, if say, um, the goalkeeper had been injured and we were bringing in a lone goalkeeper who was going to play, then you're thinking, well, if this guy doesn't work, we're in big trouble. So I think it's an absolute, it's a free hit, isn't it? And if he does mm. well, he stays at the end of the season. If he doesn't do well, he doesn't play. And then he goes back at the end of the season. The other thing I think about him is that Where's our gap at the moment? If you think about our starting 11, it's on the left. That's where Brian Hill's been playing. Where's Timo Werner's best position? I would suggest it's probably coming from the left. We know it's not as a number nine centre forward. He comes in from the left. He's rapid. What he is, is a smart football. He may not be, his finishing may have let him down, certainly in the Premier League, but he's smart. I think he will, he can pick a, pick a good pass. He's obviously very quick. And I've said this many times. If Ange wants to sign yeah. him, you, there must and doesn't matter what anybody says actually it doesn't matter what you say or I say or any of the naysayers out there about what he can and can't do and has obviously looked at what he can do and probably what he can't and he'll know exactly what he can get out of him and where he sees Werner fitting into this system and yeah. I'm and I'm here for it Gary w- sorry go on guys go, go on. on no we, we were discussing last week that um you know Ange Ange is a, a proper coach and the, the mm. noise is that Ange said that he wants Werner and believes that there is something in Werner's game that he can get something out of. I don't know what you're about to ask me, John, but I just <laughs> want to make a list of um, people or strikers that have gone to Chelsea with huge reputations and never come back with those reputations quite the same. Alvaro Morata, Andre Shevchenko, Romelu Lukaku, Fernando Torres, Hernan Crespo, Kai Havertz, Gonzalo Higuain, uh, Ramadal Falcao, Ke- uh, Mutu, uh, Adrian Mutu, Matai Kesman, Samuel Eto'o. Yeah. All it's of it's those. a place where strikers go to die. Yeah, it, all of those went to Chelsea and and tarnished their reputations. Now the problem is, I mean, all jokes aside, because Chelsea is a dreadful football club, and you know one would have sympathy for a player going there and their reputation going down the toilet. But perhaps they should learn from previous errors and mistakes. Genuinely, yeah. Danny Drinkwater. Um, yeah. Anyway, um, basically, don't go to Chelsea. Um, but coming back from there, the concern for me is he's gone back to Red Bull. Where he had That's a what lot, I was going to where ask he you. had a lot of success, mm. and where he made his name, and the form seems to have carried on, mm. and that that's where the concern is. With all of that, though, I do agree with Jake that um, it is a free hit. It's an absolute free hit, and it makes a lot of sense. And would I rather see Timo Werner lining up for us at Old Trafford on the weekend or Brian Hill? Well, we know my thoughts on Brian Hill, so it, Timo Werner hands yeah, down. Wh- 
Some people have said, oh, it's like when we signed Dan Juma. Dan Juma was, for me, a clear stopgap. Didn't really know where he fitted. Nice footballer, but... Yeah, and also somebody that Conte had no interest in. No yeah, interest very, in. Completely very different clear. Situation. This is definitely set up and for, if it works for both parties, Team of Vernon will become and, a and other people are saying, And other people are saying, oh, we've gone from Harry Kane to Team of Vernon. This is not Harry Kane's replacement, right? Who is? We've been on that, this road. Like, it's absolutely ridiculous. But it's same, no, but, it, but, it, but it's not in the same position, so... Yeah. Somebody may come along. If we signed a number nine, then you go, oh, well, how is he going to stack up against Kane? But it's two completely different. He's not even going to play through the middle. Uh, is no. he? Well, he no. may, he may not. But, you know, what, what he does give us are tremendous options. And if Ange can breathe some life into him, then I think it, it, it could be a really, really good sign. I was saying, yeah, sorry, no without, without wishing to, 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 to blow my own trumpet here, <laughs> right? We were asked by Mark, Mark McAdam uh, last week, I think it was, or the week before, outside of centre-back, where would you want to see a player come in? And I said in this very pod, if we could get a left-winger come striker, that would be handy. Yeah. And then you said centre-mid, full-back, goalkeeper, <laughs> no, but, T-boy. But, um. but, but my first one was left-wing come striker. That would be very handy. And it is. And when, when Son comes back, you've got the options. I mean, the pace of this front line, Werner, Son, Johnson. My God. Well, and the back line when they're all fit. Yeah, well, that's what Ange wants. Yeah. yeah. Right, so you had a, you asked questions. Is he going to play up front? Is he going to play on the left? I'm not sure. I want to know why he has gone back to Leipzig and hasn't got back in the team. That concerns me a little bit. Should we talk to someone who's got probably the answers to all of those questions? Yeah. Right, let's do that right now. Delighted to be joined once again by the athletic Seb Stafford-Bleur. Seb, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me back. No, great to, great to see you again and to talk to you. So, got you on primarily uh, to talk about Timo Verne. You've written a, a great article in The Athletic this week uh, about him. I've got a lot of questions. We've talked about it. We've got questions. Some of those that only Timo himself will be able to answer on the pitch, but your best place to answer some of them now. Mine, specifically, is I have a little bit of a concern um, not just on his, his Chelsea career, I think you, wrote, you, you you said in your article, litigating the Premier League section of his career is as difficult as it is worthless. He can be damned for it and it can be mitigated. So sort of parking his troubles at Chelsea, for me, it's not getting in the Leipzig team. Are we getting a player on the way down? I know he's only 27, but where is he at in his career? Well, I, I suppose him not being in the Leipzig team is really the product of, he doesn't really have a role. So, Michael Reza plays a 4 2 2 2, um, which calls for a couple of number, well, really a number nine, that's sort of a nine and a half, ten top of the pitch, and a pair of tens behind. And Werner probably isn't good enough to dis- displace Lewis Appender as one of the nines. Uh, he's not as complete as Benjamin Sesko. He can't do the things that Yusuf Paulson can. So those, those two positions at the top of the pitch are off the table. He's by nobody's measure like a playmaking number 10. So yeah, I, I think there has been, well, there's certainly been no renaissance. There's no, he hasn't come back to the Bundesliga, hasn't set it alight, hasn't restored his confidence completely. At the same time, the reality is his best position, his best role just doesn't really exist at RB Leipzig at the moment. So let's talk about his best role because Andrew's made it, well, it, the noises are and very much wanted Werner and that's what really uh, motivated Werner to come. If you had been a fly on the wall in that conversation, what do you imagine Ange would have been saying to Werner as to where he'd be playing and where he'd get the best out of him? Yeah, really good question. I think he, I mean, role-wise, I think you'd probably say, look, you, you can be plugged in anywhere across the front three, really. Uh, you can play left, play right, play through the middle. I think what, I think part of Ange's brochure would probably be that, look, I've got a record here of, I can take players, I can kind of hide their weaknesses in my formation. Now, look look around the team at the moment. Like, he's going to get Chino Lo Celso, who I, all, I think we all thought was broken beyond yeah. repair, had absolutely yeah. no future, not just in at Spurs, but in England. Mm, yeah. He looks like, he's not James Madison, but he's a pretty good deputy. He's played really well. Um, I think we've seen, I think, some of the best performances from Dejan Kulisewski mm. since he arrived at the club. I think, like, especially when he comes inside. Mm. Um, Eve Basuma. Uh, Brennan Johnson, you know, TBD. Richarlison is an interesting one. Still not a perfect number nine, but I think he's played the best football of his short Tottenham career over the past six weeks. Mm-hmm. I think this is what he'd say. Like, I know how to take your strengths and apply them in a way that makes them most effective. And I think for Werner, who is out of the Germany team as well as being out of the Leipzig team at the moment, that's a pretty good sell, right, guys? Because you, you get so like, we're not going to ask you to do the things that you're not good at, which is really the problem at Chelsea. Like, I'm not, 
he underperformed at Chelsea. He uh, made a bit of a spectacle of himself. He missed chances he should have taken. There's no getting away from that. At the same time, he went from playing for uh, Ralph Ranick twice, Ralph, Hus Ralph Houston, Hasten Hoodle, sorry, um, and Julian Nagelsmann, and then he joined a Chelsea who were being coached by Frank Lampard with the greatest respect. <laughs> like, no, well said. You say like, that so dismissively. <laughs> it, it's, it's more that I, I, I like, you go from Hasten Hoodle, Nagelsmann, Ranick, right? You, you know where you stand with them. You may not like their football, but you know that you're a cog in a system and that you are a function of a team to someone who, um, I, I don't know what Frank Lampard's managerial career will add up to at the end of it, but um, I don't know what he stands for in the kind of ideological sense. So mm -hmm. for someone like Werner, who's used to being a component, who really has been all his career, you're, 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 you're kind of, you're presented as this, this feature goal scorer, which I know he scored a lot of goals, not really the same thing as being a feature goal scorer. I don't think anybody in Germany would have described him as a sort of, as a goal scorer in the way that you might describe Robert Lewandowski, mm. for instance, or Harry Kane, like that kind of player. It's mm. just not the same. Mm. Um, and Poster Coglio, I reckon, is able to say, this will be your role, whether you're starting in games, whether you're coming onto the pitch after an hour against knackered Premier League defences, which, by the way, guys, on the basis of some of the defending we saw across Christmas, been a pretty good weapon to yeah. use against some of those, on, at least you know, certainly in, in transitional situations. Um, but also, this is what I'm going to ask you to do, like in a very specific way. And and I, I think that's very appealing. And also, um, I think for, for a club of Tottenham size to want Timo Werner is, I don't know, it would have been really heartening for him. It's a great platform to potentially kind of correct the perception around him that, that was left over from his Chelsea career. Um, so I, I just think it's a, it's win-win for everybody. And, and also... Um, I don't know whether I, I I don't know enough about the negotiations to understand whether the sort of the financial terms of the agreement between the two clubs were discussed with him, but there's no pressure on him. Like right. if he if he if he fails, well, it's kind of his problem. Yeah, you know, it's an opportunity. The club are under no obligation to buy him. Uh, the wage is not um, ridiculous. Uh, there is no fifty million pound transfer fee as there was the last time. It's a bit of a free hit for everybody involved, and I think that would have appealed to him too. There's no there's no glare. There's nothing. He's also not really expected to displace any of the first choice players, I, I don't think, especially mm. when Son returns from injury mm. or from international break, sorry. Also, Seb, it, it sounds to me like, kind of in answer to Johnny's question, that there is, as far as you're concerned, a good player in there. There perhaps always was a good player in there. And actually, what is going to be unlocked or repositioned or put back in from Ange more than anything else is what's going on up here mentally. He's going he's, he's gonna to give him as you said, a clear plan of what he wants him to do. But also, and with that, just the confidence to go out and express himself and kind of show everybody what what he used to be. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I was sort of short of saying that there's a kind of reclamation here because I think I think the truth about Timo Werner is that he he's a perfectly good player, mm. but he is just that. He's not an outstanding player and he never will be. And he never will be. He never has been really. He was kind of, his goal scoring was a function of how good Leipzig were as a, as a system. And what they, how they manifested in attacking areas, and how he suited that. But I think you can, I think he can certainly rediscover kind of a steady baseline of performance in the mm -hmm. same way that he once did. I think one of the big problems with Werner is that we're all guilty of this. I'm not pointing fingers, but like, player completes a big Premier League transfer from a league where a lot of people who watch Chelsea, for instance, in in this particular example, they don't. I don't imagine they watched the Bundesliga or did watch the Bundesliga mm -hmm. week in and week out. So. You look at his statistics, you look at the fee, and you think goal scorer, right? Mm. You think this is the guy, and that really never was who he was. And also, uh, there was there wasn't really much of a discussion about his flaws in during that transfer or immediately afterwards. And had had people in Germany been asked, they would have said misses chances, not a natural finisher, has kind of a winger's stride in the in the way that he he actually moves, um, but. If you get him in the right situation, you can get this contribution from him. And I, I think that's what Spurs are aimed at. And mm -hmm. if you if you think about it practically, if you said if we all sat down now and said, right, well, he'll, he'll guarantee you five goals, five assists between now and May. I think you count that as a success. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that 100 yeah. percent. Well, so to have that. Well, I said Brian Gill's not. No, he's not doing that. And yeah, Johnson and, can't play on the left. 
So he's a position we really, really need to fill. But I really like what Seb said about coming on after 60 minutes mm. against NAC and Premier League defence. You've got that pace and that intensity. One thing that dropped off for of Tottenham is intensity as games have gone on. Yep. You get Werner, a hard presser, a hard run, a hard worker with the pace as well. That's yeah, perfect. I just think it fits. Yeah. I was when, when I when I wrote an article recently for the Athletic. I, I was speaking to Duncan Alexander, who's mm. um, head of our stats work and data work here, and he was talking about how one of the one of the kind of functions of Werner's play is that because he's so quick, you don't ever if you're a fullback or a, like a, a six or a centre back, you don't be left one on one with him, mm. regardless of how good his finishing may have been. You have to have support, and when you have elsewhere on the side players like Madison, Son, Charlison, Johnson. Like Lefelso, maybe, or uh, uh, Pat Saar, Kulisevsky, absolutely Kulisevsky. Pat Saar, who I think is is like, I kind of believe how good he's been, really, mm. um, and how in- encouraging he is as a number eight already. Um, I think when you when you start to consider things like displacement and like how he disrupts a defense, I think it's a really interesting. Mm. Like even if he's kind of like a, I don't know how you describe him, like a like a a, a scarecrow. That just attracts stuff, yeah, right? Yeah. Like he's still, mm, he's still a kind of a valuable asset. Yeah. I don't know if it is, but yeah, we'll use nice. it. We'll go. <laughs> I can't think of a better one. <laughs> uh, so moving on from Vern, another article you wrote recently uh, was about Paolo Fonseca. It was really yeah. fascinating to me because, at about what we two years ago, his name came up with with the Spurs job, and Twitter went into meltdown as it likes to do. And I didn't know much about him, but I'd seen that his teams had played pretty attacking football, which seemed to be. Reading between the lines was an article on Sky Sports that at the time that was the reason we didn't hire him. Um, and I noticed that he sort of said he, football isn't for the weak and he likes to play attacking football. And he's really done that with Lille. So I was just interested, when, when you spoke to him, was there any sense that he would have taken the Spurs job? And how do you think he would have done? Because actually his profile seems quite similar to Andy's in the way he, he believes, what he believes in the way he plays football. Yeah, I mean, Paolo is certainly moved on from that period of his career from the Tottenham things. We we didn't talk specifically about it. I, I think his his perspective on that is that he's spoken about it enough in the past and people will talk about that kind of sliding doors moment. What I will say is that like, if you spend time with him, like a lot of when you get the chance to when you get like a privilege and opportunity to talk to some of these guys, um they, they sort of they want to usher you out the door as quickly as possible. They don't really actually want to talk about football. Whereas Paolo Fonseca could talk to you about football all day and has this incredible passion for not just the game, but how it should be played. And this sort of sense of, no, the game is a spectacle. And what we're doing on the pitch is uh, we are we are tasked with entertaining people and giving fans something to buy into. Which is similar to Ange, right? 100%. Yeah. And it's what I was actually thinking when I was talking to him, because he, he was saying, I forget whether I included this in, in, the, in the article, but... We were talking a little bit about the way when he first came to Lille, asked whether how, how important is it to get people to buy into like your goalkeeper taking a few risks and your defenders playing out from the back. And like if you watch Lille, you see there are risks in their game. And, and there's a kind of you, you've got to be quite brave to be a like a, you know, a six taking a ball off a defense in that system because there's just so much pressure around you and they want that pressure and the pressing. And he said, yeah, it's really important. And and. and you know, they, they bought into it really quickly and they were really enlivened by what we're trying to do and they've been really, really supportive. And he also said, my players wanted to be coached that way because the Lille team that he inherited had actually been kind of dismantled from the side yeah. that had won the Liga a few years, uh, the year before and they sunk in the mid-table. And what he was left with was like the task of rebuild this team with a young group in a way that you want. And I don't know, like I, it's not what he said, but it, I, I just wonder whether he'd have got that opportunity at Spurs. Um, I think he's, I think he's a wonderful coach. I love watching his teams play. I think also um, he's, he's just a, he's a very good person to talk to. He's a very kind of admirable human being. I think Paolo Fonseca. If you if you kind of read up on the things that have happened in his life and um, you know the importance of family and and the stuff that stuff that has sort of has happened since he left Ukraine. And obviously his, his wife is Ukrainian and um, he's got a lot of friends at Shakhtar still and there's a lot of ties back into Ukrainian society. It's an enormously difficult period for him. But um, one of those coaches who I think, and he, he said this, he, he said that he thinks that fans are kind of turned away from coaches who don't take risks anymore. 
Mm, and I remember this thinking, really sounds like Ange. <laughs> it really does. Yeah, but it, 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 also it kind of it made my heart sing a little bit, right? Because I think we can all relate to that in the sense that last couple of years at Spurs, been just yeah, we we all, we all got bored of it and fed up with it, and you couldn't give tickets away, and now everybody wants to come back. And like we were talking about the, the we're going to talk about the Burnley game, and it was a full house yeah. and. That's for an FA Cup game in January on a when Friday it's night, freezing. Yeah. on a Friday night, yeah. And I, I, I left England a few years ago, and I tell you, when you move to a different country, I don't know if you guys have done that, but it's really easy to fall out of the the pattern of it because you don't go to games anymore. I was used to sort of um, covering them as a as a journalist for a long time, and and you know just took it for granted. And you also kind of take for granted that feeling of of uh, oh, I'm looking forward to it. It's first playing tonight, even if it even if it is. Friday night against Burnley at home in the FA Cup. Yeah. You think, oh, it's, it's great. That's, that's what I'm doing with my evening. Mm -hmm. And if you can't go, you're going to watch and, you know, friends and all that kind of stuff. That vanished uh, over the last couple of years, obviously. And um, you kind of sit through the games resentfully. And when I was talking to Palo and Saka, I, I remember thinking, yeah, if I was a Lille fan, I'd probably feel the same way that I do about Tottenham at the moment, yeah. you know, because they're a spectacle. And yeah, I just, um, it, was a, it was a great opportunity. It's, it's funny, actually, because um, when you when you have an interview, sometimes oh, you obviously you, you check for for time. Like are you okay for twenty minutes? And I was like, how how are you doing for time? He's like, oh, I got all day. And yeah. I was just like, that's just, all right. It's kind of express sort of the way he thinks about yeah. the game, which is this natural enthusiasm, not put on for journalists and stuff like that, or the media. It's just um, yeah, it's a great experience. And I kind of wish he had been a Tottenham coach, to be honest. Mm. Um, well, we would have we'd have had that not wasted those two years on the <laughs> or however long it was yeah, on the Conte, that gap. Sure. Um, but we'd, I mean, we may never have got to Ange. Um, like I said, it's a great read. Go and read that as well. Uh, oh, thank you. On The Athletic. Uh, just going back to Werner before we let you go, little prediction on how you think it's going to go. Is it going to go well? And then we all hope, look, he has a great time and gets back in the Germany team and scores a consolation in the final against England and we're going <laughs> to win it. But, <laughs> you know, what's going to happen? Go on. I think he'll do perfectly fine. I think he will score four or five goals. I think he'll have some moments. I, I don't really foresee this ever becoming a permanent transfer, but then... That's not how I would judge it. Mm. He will do a job for six months, I think, and he will um, give the squad something it doesn't have. And then I think the club will probably look towards something a little bit more long term. And he's 27, right? Mm. And and I think also um, we're we're in the process of building a squad, aren't we? Window by window. And um, I I think I don't think Timo Werner is strategy. I think he's a solution. If mm. that isn't too pretentious, or if, uh, if, you, if, if you understand the difference, yeah. yeah. And, 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 and as one, I think that's great because I think actually, um, if anything, Spurs haven't been good enough at this yeah, for ages. Yeah, like they haven't been good at identifying that guy that says, "All right, between now and that and the summer, when we want to achieve X, Y, and Z, we need this player with this set of abilities." Well, we said this and about Dan Juma, sir, but he just seemed to come in and Conte didn't want yeah. him. He was never going to sign. What was the point? But this exactly. is a, this is a this is a, a we need this guy now. And Son's gone yeah. for, for five six weeks and. We need something on the, the irony left. of that, yeah. Johnny, is that I would almost say that Dan Juma is a more talented player than Timo Werner. <laughs> but the difference need. being, it's yeah. like, not what you need. Yeah. And so doesn't play. And yeah. also, well, Conte didn't think Basuma could play either. So I, <laughs> yeah, yeah, his opinion doesn't club <laughs> sign. <laughs> I don't know what to do with that, right? You train with this guy all, all week and you go, oh, I, I, I can't find a use for him. No, he didn't think, okay. think Basuma could play. That's what he said. Oh, that's that's what, what he said. Oh, he's... Basuma, not yeah, Dan Juma. Yeah, yeah, Basuma. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, what do you do with that? <laughs> Yeah, I don't know how to respond to that. Like, yeah, uh, yeah well, good luck to him. Sort of <laughs> nah. nah. Um, uh, Seb, really great to have you on uh, again. And Thanks, I'll say Seb. it again. Uh, head over to Seb's social media and pick up the articles it is written on Werner and Fonseca and, and Seb loves the Spurs, uh, which is always great to see his thoughts on that. Um, and thanks for coming on. We'll talk to you soon, Seb. Cheers, Seb. Cheers, Seb. Come on, thank you, guys. Happy New Year. Great insight from from Seb. Uh, go and read the article, uh, his article at the Athletic. So look, I'm looking forward to it. I, I, I'm really excited to see someone like Werner. Um, he's got he's got a lot about him, and hopefully Ange can get it out of him. So we'll see. Well, I was going to say I don't I, I don't see any player at Tottenham that has got worse since Ange has arrived. There yeah. may have been players that haven't got better, but yeah. no one's got yeah. worse. So agreed. It, yeah, agreed. Right, moving on, Burnley. I like this podcast because <laughs> because uh, it's got three people that go to Spurs every week. And <laughs> how, did you enjoy it? How was your night? Did you go, or was it just me? Do you know what? You're such a git, right? Because there's so many games that that we both go to. 
I, go, I, I, I chose to give this one a miss because for me... Friday the, night. It, Friday it, night. No, look, it, it, if I was still working in town, which I, I, I no longer do, I work from home, and if I had been in town, uh, I would have gone down. It would have been a great, <laughs> after, it would great afternoon, great evening. Okay. Um, this time last year for the third round, I took my daughter to her first game against Portsmouth. And, and you know, it's just the fact that it was Friday night at 8 o'clock, mm. trekking into town for that game. Like, nah, not, not about that. Will I be going to the City game? Absolutely. Jake, same excuses. Well, reasons, no, but you ran to Gary's. I don't have a daughter. <laughs> um, I yeah, I just didn't go. What can I say? Well, went. you went. How was it? Um, That's what you wanted here. Was you, well, you went? Well, well done. Thank you. Proper fan. I actually think there was a couple of things that put me off going. One was Burnley, <laughs> because you know, I didn't see it as I didn't see it as a particularly uh, sexy glamour game. tie. Yeah, glamour tie. No. Uh, Friday night, not that into for football, personally. Traditionalist, three o'clock Saturday, or he's not going. Um, and yeah, and that's and that's it. And I, and actually, um, not wish. I'm not going to sit here and say I knew it would be a dull game, but it wasn't a great game, was it? No, you no, asked me how it was. Oh, the four of us went, and it was. It's always nice to go with with the family. The game. Look at you treating the family. Yeah, that's a good Cheap package. Tickets, though, was it? That. Fifty <laughs> quid. Fifty <laughs> quid for four that, tickets. That's right, a very good go. package. Yeah, yeah, it's a really good deal, and the place. Actually, walking up. To the game, it's not. It's, it's very uh, being popular is quite cheap these days, isn't it? What for? Top, what do you mean? Just in your house. <laughs> <laughs> you should come round, one mate. Um, I went for the invite. So I went, and I was walking up. I thought, oh my god, it's empty here tonight. And actually, the place was full. Yeah, a really good atmosphere. A lot of a lot of families. The I have to say, I was surprised. I I assumed that it, w- it wouldn't be full. Well, yeah. when they get the ticket, Packed. when they look, they get the ticket pricing right, and and the team is good. These things will, do the full think, stadium will follow. Do we think it'll be four tickets for 50 Well, I was wondering that against Man City. It should be. It should be. You can't like, it, uh, you know, that's their cup policy. You can't amend it per per game. We'll based see. On, yeah, but we'll see. Well, I wondered we'll also if the time of the kickoff had a, had an effect on the ticket price as well. Do no, he's done no, that. They've done that for the FA Cup game. It was the same last year. Yeah. Yeah, but we didn't play anyone. Who did we play? Portsmouth at home. Yeah. But they did it for Morecambe. Yeah, exactly. Brighton at home a few years ago was the same. Also a Friday night. Well, it might have been a Saturday. That was a Saturday night. Eight o'clock. You look confused. Didn't we play them? It Wasn't there a replay? Emerson Royale scored. That was against Brighton, wasn't it? Yeah. scored as well for them, I think. No, he just had a good game. I think it was 1-0. Yeah, sure. but no, no. no. W- wasn't, that, wasn't that a replay? Didn't we have to play them in a replay on a Wednesday night? No. Was that s- some other time? No. All right. Right, let's, let's talk about the game. Very quickly. Actually, do we have to talk about No, that? I literally just want to say we've got through it, basically. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we, we got through it. Richarlison had a poor game. He wasn't the only one. Uh, good to see Van der Ven on the bench. The fallout is, as always, there was an injury. There was another injury. Ben Davies has done his hamstring and it could be a bad one. Great to see Benton Kerr get 80 minutes. There was a little bit of worry because he got a knock and came mm. off, but Anne said he was fine. Mm. The two best chances of the game came to them. Um, Dooney missed one in the first half. Somehow he put it over. And then we went one up. Richardson managed to dummy an open goal, but they didn't clear properly. The goalie stra- rolled it basically straight to Porro, who absolutely leathered it. And I thought, it, one of those shots, you know, you see a shot, if you're not in the best angle, I was in the East End. You thought it was Friday going night. Well over. I was like, oh, yeah. okay. And then suddenly they were hitting the net just bulged. You're like, oh my God, uh, great hit. And then they send their keeper off. It was about six foot eight. Flicks it on. And uh, and Dooney sticks one. wasn't an easy finish, but we've got through it. And we play City. And uh, we've talked a few weeks ago about playing City at home in the FA Cup. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We've had three cup draws this season. All Premier League teams. All Premier League mm. teams. Um, the 18 of the 20 Premier League teams are still in it, I think. Only Arsenal. Yeah. Hey. Three. And Burnley went out. But it opens up. After this tie, because you're going to you lose, through it, yeah. you're going to lose one of Chelsea and Villa, Fulham, Newcastle. and you're going to lose one of Fulham, Newcastle. You're going to lose one of Tottenham and City. So you're going to lose City. <laughs> <laughs> uh, big talk. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it does open up after this round. Um, okay, so we're in. We're through. Let's look yeah. ahead to um, Sunday against Man United. But the first thing we're going to do is we're going to talk to. Uh, we're going to welcome back a guest on onto the show. We had Ian Irving. I don't think either of you were on the show when Ian. I definitely was. Like, no, it was Antula oh. and uh, Jake number two. Ah, Jake's on. Eventful show. Yeah, that was the eventful show. So he had he had a much better looking panel than we've got today. Yeah. Um, Apologies, what, Ian, in advance. Uh, before we get into it, we'll 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 have a chat with Ian.
Delighted to be joined once again by Ian Irving from the Talk of the Devils podcast. Ian, thanks so much for joining us again. I thought you were just going to use that first recording, no? <laughs> oh, <laughs> listen, we can't all be... We, it's, it's absolute... Right, sod this. Right, Ian, congratulations Hello. on being uh, nominated up with the best podcasts out there. How does it feel to be amongst the best? Yeah, it's a good place to be, as you know. Uh, many congratulations on your nomination, especially in your first year. It's pretty good going, that, to be yeah. fair. And um, obviously vote for us. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I've not looked up the last time Spurs did a double over United. I might have to look at that. Be a treble this year, won't it? Yeah. Do you not yeah. just know it? No, I don't just know no. it. Uh, no, as we say, Ian's uh, great pod, Talk of the Devils. They finished runners-up uh, last year in the Best Team uh, Podcast Awards. Lost to the pod that we won't mention, the other Spurs <laughs> pod. Uh, but we're here to stay now and, and we'll see you on the podium. Fingers crossed. Fingers yeah. crossed. <laughs> uh, so let's get into it. Look, never a dull day at Old Trafford. When we spoke last time, it was just after the Wolves game and they had protests that night and they had planned protests. But since then, Ineos have sort of come in, uh, taken what's reported to be 25% of the club. Has It's not been long, but, but has the mood changed? Has the gold and, uh, green and gold scars been put in the loft or are they still in the cupboard? Has it changed at all? No, no different at all. Um, that might change over time, possibly. Um, but I think United fans for the minute, obviously it's not been ratified yet. You know, it could be, uh, they were talking about four to six, maybe even eight weeks when the um, the announcement was first made on Christmas Eve. So, you know, we're still looking at maybe February, even March time, possibly for it all to be fully, fully in place. But Ineos have started work. So Dave Brailsford has been at the game. Uh, we've been playing the, the the really fun new addition to being a Manchester United fan, which is who is Dave Brailsford sat next to, uh, who is sat behind, who is in his row um, and reading into all of that as much as uh, we really shouldn't. Um, but no, there's not really been much of a difference. Uh, the home game that there's been, there was still a bit of uh, of anti-Glazer protest because the, the, the main thing is that they are still there, you know, and a, a lot of Manchester United fans wanted you know a full sale only that was certainly the motto of the 1958 group which is the, the group that sort of arranged a lot of the protests that you, you were talking about before so while they're still there I don't see that changing the only thing that might dampen it down is if that you know Ineos do start to make an impact and certainly the early noises have been very positive so um, you know it's only things like actually being in Manchester and actually speaking to staff and things like that. But it is sort of creating a little bit of positivity already. Ian, it's interesting though, because the Glazers could stay or go. How much does it actually impact if Ineos have the day-to-day -day control of footballing operations? Because ultimately, United are still in a position, regardless of who comes in, with the advent of financial fair play, we're seeing it in this window, so many teams are a bit hamstrung. And United, you know, it's not like Ineos can come in and suddenly spend a load of money. They're still hamstrung by the likes of Anthony Martial, six years ago signed, Jose Mourinho saying it's not good enough, and he's about to walk out on a free six years later. You know, you don't have an, so many players that you can sell for big, big money to, to get some financial fair play headroom. So this isn't a simple fix of coming in and throwing money at the on-the-pitch operations so, so what do Ineos do here yeah no they can't do that uh they can't sort of miraculously change United's fortunes what they can do is put money into the club which the Glazer family have never done so I think the allowance is something like 90 million over a three-year period that the ownership can put into a club which then can be added on to the the FFP uh, calculation but obviously that is only 90 million and, and mm. it's over three years and it's only once you know United, mm. United spent 90 million on Anthony um, <laughs> and uh, that's not gone great so far so th there's no magic wand um, I do think though that the onus the early onus that we've seen from them in the communication also in hearing about what they've said to staff in the meetings and things like that you know Jim Radcliffe's pretty much turned around and said he's not bothered about making money out of this he, he wants sporting success from Manchester United. He wants to see the team competing at the very highest level, winning trophies again. Exactly how they do that, obviously, is in question. But if you actually unpack the money that United have spent, they've not spent it very wisely over no. the last couple of years. But then if you can move forward and think, right, well, the amount of money that you have spent, obviously, the calculations change every year because it's a rolling period. So as they move forward, there will be money to spend because United make money. That's never yes. been an issue. There is that little bit of a buffer that the ownership can can sort of you know complement what's there already. So there will be money to spend, but I don't think well it definitely won't be in January. 
And even in the summer, there's huge question marks at the moment about exactly how things are structured behind the scenes, who comes in, who goes, how does any of that impact on the manager as well? Mm. At what point did they take a view on him? So, yeah. you know, almost at this point, spending money isn't that much of a worry. It feels like there's tons to do before um, we even get to that stage in a way. Yeah. Just on Ineos, Ian, <clears throat> they sort of spread themselves across a lot of sports around the world. Do you know enough? Have they been successful in everything they've they've done so far? Are you confident that they can bring success uh, to the club? Well, I don't think they can do any worse uh, <laughs> in terms of the way that United have, have been run over time. And in fact, even in some of the communication around this investment, there's even been some sort of uh, admission for the first time from the Glazer family that it's not gone as well as they'd hoped in a sporting sense. Um, the, the, the thing for United is, you know, the, the standards are set as high as they were when yeah. Sir Alex Ferguson was in charge. And that is always going to be where the club look to get back to, whether they'll ever get back to a stage where you're winning, what, 13 Premier League titles in 20 years. Mm. I highly doubt. I don't know if that will ever happen again for anyone over such a long period. Uh, I know Manchester City are dominating things at the moment, clearly, but um, I, I, I just think that United's ownership, it's certainly in recent times, has felt like a huge cloud around the club. And we've seen with other teams, investment, um, changes of ownership, even this not being a full uh, takeover, the fact that they're, they've gone for full sporting control and they will be looking after day-to-day -day running of football matters at United just feels like a huge gear shift. And you're right, you know, if you look back at Ineos's investment in sport, even their investment in football and their ownership of Nice in particular, it's not been perfect by any stretch. There's been mistakes made. They admit that themselves as well from what's been said. Um, but you have to feel that with the know-how that they've got, uh, with the money that, that's there, I mean, all right, Ratcliffe said that he's not bothered about making money out of it, but he's certainly not going to want to lose and billions and billions and billions. Mm, and also, sure. he's, he's, he's 70, 72, is he? Something like that. I mean, I, I can't see his last sort of huge move in the sporting world. Yeah, supposedly, he's a Manchester United fan. You know, he's been a season ticket holder. He, he was born in Greater Manchester, Failsworth, just outside Manchester. I can't see him wanting this to go badly. Mm. And, you know, you don't become at the level that they're at with with failure after failure there has been you know a lot of success in there and i guess united fans are just hoping that this is the the big hurrah at the end of jim ratcliffe's career really well then therefore ian what do you see as maybe success for this season because obviously you know what they want to do going forward but how does success for this season look like and what what would you see as like the on fit on pitch philosophy going forward well, the only way this season can be classified as a success now, I would say, and this is really rescuing it from, you know, the, the position it's in at the moment, is winning the FA Cup and mm. making the top four, top five, whatever it ends up being in the Premier League to get in the Champions League. I think anything less than that, considering the way last year went and considering the positivity that there was at this sort of stage of last season, uh, won't feel like success. Uh, even then, you know, would people have taken that at the start of this season? Maybe if they felt like there was progress being made. A big part of last year, wasn't just winning the, the League Cup and getting to the FA Cup final and getting back in the Champions League. It was also the way it felt. You know, United felt like a coherent unit again. They felt like you knew what they were doing week to week and there was progress there. And it felt like they were going to then make another step. This year has just felt nothing like that whatsoever. Um if they've taken a step forward, it's been immediately a step back that's followed in the in the next game. And I mean, you sort of watch the game against Wigan in the FA Cup. That's mm. probably one of about two or three sort of routine wins they've had this year, which is remarkable considering we're in January. Mm. Um, and I think that is probably the biggest criticism of Ten Hag. They've had a lot of injuries. I know that's a, a difficult topic speaking oh, yeah. to you guys as well because <laughs> it feels like everyone's had a lot of them, yeah. especially to important players in Spurs' case. But um, it, it has been really, really difficult to get any sort of continuity or any any sort of pattern to Manchester United's play. And almost that's the biggest criticism of Ten Hag, but he's also got the biggest excuse because there has been so many problems well, with availability. Well, well, can I just ask you on that? Because when... This has been my biggest shot with Ten Hag. When he was at Ajax, and we played Ajax over two legs of Ten Hag in the semi-final of the Champions yeah. League, right? And and you could really see what they were about and what they were trying to do. And you mentioned last season, and if we sort of mitigate this season and say injuries, so on, a lot going on. Even last season, United had 
a degree of success. I sit here and I talk to my United friends. I'm like, I don't get what your identity is on the pitch. I don't get what you're trying to do. You know, you look at, I can't stand Antonio Conte, but it was clear what he wanted to do. Mm. You know, <laughs> uh, Ange Postacoglu, it's clear what he wants to do. They have a philosophy. What is Ten Hag's philosophy at United? Because I assumed he'd bring it from Ajax and he just hasn't. There's been a lot of contradiction, hasn't there? I mean, he's even overtly came out and said, you know, United won't play the way that Ajax played, which at the time seemed quite shocking. But then you sort of dug down into the reasons why he said that in terms of the different expectations, the different players available, uh, the different sort of culture of the club as well. Um, it's difficult to know what the philosophy is. I mean, in pre-season, he was sort of coming out with the, the line that he wanted to change United from being what you were talking about last season, which th there was there was more of a style about, about last season, but he, basically he wanted to make Manchester United the best transition team in the world. And mm. that was about high pressing. That was about winning the ball back as soon as possible. It was also about breaking from deep and counter-attacking and all the other stuff that you'd, you'd sort of, more, the more traditional ideas of, of transition, but it just hasn't happened. Um, Early part of the season, remarkably, despite the up and down form, the stats were still good in terms of winning the ball back in high. Oh, don't listen situations. to the stats here, mate. Don't listen to the stats. Well, you know how important <laughs> they are, pal. Um, but and Tenag was quite happy to sit there and talk mm, about that in his press conference as well, and point that out. Um, but unfortunately, you know, if that's not resulting in goals and winning games, then it's it's almost ignored a little bit, isn't it? And um, that mm. that fight to get back to to what he believes United should be is almost going to be the difference about whether he maintains his position as United manager under the new ownership or not, I think. Um, and the injuries as well, like he's sort of talked about the next month as being quite crucial because Martinez is back, Casemiro's back, mm. uh, Mason Mount's been in and out, but he should be back. Luke Shaw should be back again. Um, right, all for, talking all about for players. Sunday. No, not all of those for Sunday. Some of them for Sunday though. Um <laughs> But then if you look at United's bench against Wigan, you know, the, I think there's about 40 first team games mm. between them all. Um, obviously, Onana's still around as well, which is a bizarre situation. Yeah, totally. uh, he'll be playing against Spurs. Is that a good um, thing for Spurs or United? I don't know. No, it's a good thing for United, yeah. <laughs> he has made his errors, yeah, yeah. undoubtedly. He's his first but, choice um, keeper, yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, and Altai Bayandi hasn't played a minute. No. Um, mm. And the fact that, you know, everyone seems so desperate to keep Andre Onana for as long as possible is a really strange situation for a guy who was pushing to be Turkish number one and the Fenerbahce number one at the end of last season as well. It's a really strange situation that. Um, in terms of the weekend, who is back? Uh, Christian Eriksen could be back. Uh, Harry Maguire could be back. Uh, Luke Shaw could be back. That's probably about it. So they've probably still got best part of maybe nine or ten players missing. United also seems to have players missing through illness every single game at the moment, which is another another bizarre situation. Martial's not played for about five games, I think, with illness now. So it's just a, a bit of a strange situation. Well, just that. before we let you go in, quick look to Sunday. I've, I've got the stat. We haven't beaten you twice in the league since 89-90. We actually did the treble. I remember winning 3-0 at Old Trafford in the League wow. Cup. So, I don't know. Quick, quick <laughs> prediction and thoughts uh, for Sunday. It's so hard to know with United. Mm. It is so difficult to know. Mm. Um, if Wigan had been really good the other night, then I would have expected it to drop completely against Spurs. But the fact that Wigan was sort of like a routine win, but there were still bits of it that weren't great and it looked like you know they couldn't finish the dinner <laughs> and it needed a pretty dubious penalty yeah. to, to sort of seal it late on as well. That's generous, dubious. It's just very difficult to know. The, the only thing that gives me confidence, I was looking again at stats, um, from early December, Spurs are the second worst defence in the Premier League in yeah. terms of expected goals. Mm -hmm. um, and the high line and the way that United exploited Aston Villa's high line in what's pretty much their best performance of the season on Boxing Day, certainly in that second half, gives hope that maybe they could do something similar. I mean, I fully expect it to be a Garnacho, Hoyle and Rashford front line. There's a lot of pace in there. Um, runs in behind against Villa really worked. Um but I guess from your perspective, there's quite a few, there's quite a few bits of ammo on your side as well, isn't there? Really, it's just how you're going to be without Son. I mean, it's a massive, it's a massive, massive bonus for United yeah, yeah. to be for you to be missing him. Definitely. Yeah, Werner might play, and he'll he'll provide a bit of pace and get him behind United. Uh, but we're missing him. We don't know if 
the extent of Ben Davis's injury, but he'll be out. Van der Veen might be back. So yeah, I don't know what Tottenham are going to turn out, quite frankly. But give us a prediction. So we're both in the same boat then, aren't we? This is good. <laughs> yeah, because we'll take um, a point. I'll take a point. Would you? Yeah. No, uh, look, honestly, we're missing for sure five first team outfield players. So half of your first team. Mm. That, that, that's yeah. the guaranteed. Uh, but even so, if Werner plays, if Van der Ven plays, I expect us to go to United and put in a really good show. Um, mm. and yeah, but I'm the pod pessimist and he's the pod optimist. So. Uh, so no, I, I'm, I'm not, say, I'm not, I'm not saying we yeah. will win, yeah. but it's a critical game for both teams. You win, you're in touch with the top five. We win, we're, we're 12 points clear of you. So it's yeah, absolutely definitely. it's absolutely critical. I'd be disappointed if Spurs went there and, and, and got turned over. I want, But I think we can win. But look at last season, the game at Old Trafford. I mean, I, I, I don't remember exactly what the expectations were for either team going into that. But that felt like such a huge display for United mm, that day. Mm. Um, and that was, was that December time, I want to say, mm. or maybe maybe November time. Um, it just felt like a huge game, that Ferret Ten Hag. It felt like everything came together uh, in that 90 minutes. And, and obviously Spurs were below where where you'd expect it to be. Tottenham have gone to Old Trafford in recent times. You'll know this even better than me, with a lot of expectation. Mm. And obviously there's been the victories there. You know, the... the, the Fact, was it five one six one whatever yeah, it was yeah. a few years ago? Um, that's the time where it, it really sort of came to fruition. But there's been other times where it's been fully expected that Tottenham are just going to run all, all over United and beat yeah. them, and it's not quite come off. So it makes it difficult to predict. So I'm going to be boring and sit on the fence. I think it'll be a draw, which I said I would take. Yeah, <laughs> and United don't draw either. They've drawn once, maybe twice, all season in all competitions. So it doesn't happen very often. All right, late dubious Bruno penalty then. Um, <laughs> another Ian, one Ian, <laughs> Ian thank you for that as always uh, good luck for Sunday good luck for uh, the awards of course and uh, you too yeah. So yeah we'll speak to you soon <laughs> asked to talk to the <clears throat> runners up in the sports podcast award <laughs> Ian Irving he, he went in two footed from the off didn't he yeah it's typical United you know what that is what? banter no, no, Run, <laughs> running scared. Hatred. Running scared. Running scared. We're here. I've told you we're here to stay. God, hopefully he doesn't listen back to this. <laughs> um, uh, we've got That's two returning guests, though, in one in one show. Using our squad. Happy like days. Ange, Happy to, days. Dig, to dig deep. Very good. Um, a good quality in the squad. Uh, not a great record at Old Trafford. We won there, what, 6-1 in the COVID season? Yeah, it was 2021, that, I think. Was yeah, it? there was the Bale one as well. No, 2020. There was the... Uh, restart. No, the, the second restart. Gary's moved on from that. You're still talking <laughs> about that. No, there, there, there was Lucas Moura one. scored we, we, we a couple. We went top of the league with that one with Marina. With Lucas Moura, the Bale, the Clint Dempsey. AVB. Yeah, um, September, October. So we've 20, had a couple right. up there. We've also had, you know, uh, the ref beat us a few times. I remember 2-0 up and then... Uh, I think it was Robbo or... No, it wasn't. Couldn't it me, it was ago, Gomez. Uh, oh, the pen Car Carrick? Yeah, yeah, down at the feet um, of Carrick. Great save, penalty. How would I remember it? Nanny scored some dodgy free kick. Like, so who knows what's going to happen? It depends if we actually get a... Uh, the rub of the green. The rub of the green. Shall we say that? It depends <laughs> if we get the rub of the green the the rather than Fernandez flopping, uh, <laughs> as he did and oh. does. Yeah. No more of that, hey? So again, no more of that. Let's but but what I will say, let's talk about Tottenham rather than United. What what I will say is, this is a game that many of us had sort of bookmarked with dread based on players that would be missing and and injuries that we would have. I think since Chelsea, we saw this game as one that that um, caused us a lot of fear, and we you know we, we well, because of Afcon and Asian yeah, and, and we've said on this pod a few times. Don't even want to think about you know the the, the team that, that that could be out there. And we're here now. And we're here now. And, we're, and actually, now that we're here, and and you look at it, and you know, assuming no more sort of bad news between now and kickoff, right? The the, the lineup that I could imagine is so much stronger than what it otherwise might have been. And, and I said to Ian, you know, if we get this team onto the pitch, I don't expect us to go and run over United, not at all. But I do expect us to go and put on a really big performance and, and get some sort of a result. And I do see it as Vicario, Porro, probably Royale. I don't think Dragushin will be in time or it'll be a big risk, no, no, uh, no. especially next to a returning Van de Ven. But that's huge. Uh, Udogi, Benton Core, we didn't see being fit for this. He is, right? Kulisovsky and Lacelso as the eights or tens. Uh, and then Johnson, Richarlison and Werner on the left. Um, and, 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 you know, we've spoken with, with, with Ian. I think, you know, the pace and directness and, and, and work rate that Werner gives us, that's a proper 11. 
And when you look at that and you think to yourself that you're missing Basuma, you're missing Romero, you're missing Sa, uh, Sa Son and... Davies? No, it's not Son and Madison. Oh, sorry, first teamers. Yeah. Five outfield first team players. Mm. And yet we're putting a team out on the pitch at Old Trafford that, call me naive, I think can go and beat them. They can. Very much so. You were starting to build a squad. Ian made the point that I think since the start of December, we've been, uh, I think, the worst in the XG faced. That the game against Burnley was our first home clean sheet since Fulham in October. We know why. Mitigating circumstances. We've had four fullbacks at the back. But again, it's the risk and reward. But you saw United come from 2 0 down to beat Villa. As bad as United have been, going to Old Trafford is, is never easy. Yeah, but all right, cliche alert. The way we're playing at the moment, don't look at me like that. No, it's, yeah, it, <laughs> you know, there's no easy games at this level. Cliche police are outside. There you go, they've come for you. <laughs> no, I'm not having that at all. We are all right. playing some good football. United are not playing very good football. And they did against Villa. Yeah, they did. Yeah, as, as Ian said, that was their best game of the season. And like, mm. the, can anybody, can we sit here and say what their second best game was? No, it was well, the, by far the, and away the, their best the game. The second game, was, I, don't, I haven't watched all of United's games, but, but they should have been ahead against us in they the second should. game of the season. Absolutely. And, and how different could things have been for them if they had have come away from that with, with the result? Yeah. But and we will give them those chances again. We will give them those chances again. Whether they'll take, but we'll also create our own chances. Oh, that I'm not concerned And about. I wouldn't say that we're a better... You couldn't say we're a better team. We will be a better team at the when we play them than we were in that game, just based on the players that we're missing. Of course. It's certainly, as a, as a, if you're looking at it as a 1 to 11. But we are three or four months further down the line in terms of the squad and the club's development under mm. Ange. And I think we're now at a point where, as you just said, or in a roundabout way, you, you 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 substitute any of these players in and you've got players coming in who now know what they need to do in that position and just got into them more. He's had more time training with them. You know, and the way that United have gone, they've just gone, they've gone like that. I, I go into this game thinking that, expecting us to win. So I don't well, know. I don't know about expecting, but I would, I, I, I believe we okay. very much can. Well, we'll, we'll come, yeah. to, we'll come to your confident. predictions. I feel, yeah. You mentioned the players that might play. Hearing the name Werner, and we've talked about it with Seb and ourselves and he has issues with he wasn't great at Chelsea and blah, blah, blah. Hearing him in the team, and I think he would start or will start when he, if he signs, oh, when he signs, he signs yeah, makes brilliant. me feel a lot better with Son being out there. Because in a game like United, if you're going to soak up a bit of pressure, you want Son on the transition. But having Werner on the transition, it's not a like for like, but it's a much... It's a, it's a, it's He's a as much, quick though, isn't he? And that's, that's important. But I just want to go back to the Seb interview. Something he said that we didn't talk about just straight after. He said, oh, even if Werner does well... He doesn't expect him to sign long term. Actually, I tend to agree with most of the things Seb says. Mm. I don't agree with that. I think if Werner comes in and hits the ground running, hopefully starting Sunday, why wouldn't we? So I don't think he fits the profile of player because ultimately we because. are looking to, because we're looking to sign players sort of sub twenty five so that they get to a point in their contract where they would still be a sell on. Yeah. Because everybody's so paranoid about FFP and so on and as much headroom as we've got he just doesn't fit the long term profile with that said if he comes in and absolutely tears it up for us then yeah we'd be demanding yeah. for 15 million euros or whatever it is you'd be demanding but I, I, I agree with Seb I think on the surface of things he would have to do exceptionally well for us to consider signing him on, on full time I think doesn't, has the to look 15, at doesn't isn't the 15 million obviously has been put in there because Tottenham think that if he does well that actually for 15 million of course. we would sign yeah, him yeah 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 of course but but I, I, regardless but, of his age and, and that because actually at 15 million it almost yeah, doesn't matter if he's got no sell uh, yeah I don't disagree I don't disagree I think I think this is very much an opportunity for Werner to put himself in the shop window mm. uh, either for ourselves or for another club to say listen play me in the right way and yeah. I can still be an asset but I do kind of agree with Seb I'd be a little bit surprised if we did un end up signing Werner um, full time full time yeah mm. but but again just, go, just going back to this United game and, and I said it to Ian this is a massive game a massive massive game United at the moment sit on 31 points they win they go uh, what is it five points behind us we win we go 12 points ahead of them right uh, and, uh, no yes we 11? go on to we go, go on to 11 four, points clear. No, we go on to 42. They're on 31. 
Yes, eleven. You're quite right. <laughs> <laughs> this is <laughs> this is why I was maths it? pod with Gary Dyne. Well, I actually thought uh, that I uh, just as a, on the face of it, I had Gary Dyne probably as probably better at, at maths than Johnny. No, so, absolutely not. And, and um, for a, what? Hang on, wait, 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 wait. For a second there, wait, for a second there, wait. No, 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 no. This is this cuts deep. <laughs> Forget the fact I'm a statistician. Forget that. What you're basically well, I can't saying even say is statistician is Gary. Gary more intelligent than me, is that what you're no, saying? No, just maths, just numbers, pure okay. numbers. Pure numbers. You're better, you may be uh, better at other things. We digress. <laughs> this, is a, this, is, this is a massive, massive game. And if we win this, it really does isolate us from, from, from what's beneath us and puts us very much on the coattails of, of the leaders. Are you saying this is, this is like a, a, instead of a relegation six-pointer, it's like a Champions League 12-pointer? <laughs> I just think it's a huge moment in both team seasons. If United no, win... You talk to me about cliches, mate. <laughs> trying I'm to try- make your own ones. I I, own. I'm sat here trying to have a football pod. You two are just... <laughs> If United win this, they're right back in the season. How many and points we behind win it, us? We're well ahead of that. You carry on. <laughs> right, I'm going to come to your predictions unless you've got anything else to talk about on no, Sunday's I'm, game. I'm just desperate to say that. Uh, well, I already did. I think. I think I'm, I go into this game confident. Should okay. I not be? You're the pessimist. The pod pessimist. It, it's unfortunate. I tell you what. If this game was at ours, wouldn't give them a forget, hope in hell. Forget the fact it's at theirs. Had. I've said this a few times in recent pods. Forget the fact you, you're always going to have injuries. Yeah. So I don't expect everybody to be back. Bring back three of the players you've mentioned, and and you have to in that regard bring back some of United. I think what we're missing is bigger than what they're missing. I, I think we win. Just it. quickly, what do we? What who do we see our starting eleven? Well, I think Gary. So I think well, you're it not picks, listening. It, it picks no. itself. <laughs> you know, it, it, you know, assuming no further injuries between now and 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 and, and the who weekend. Who do you have in and, midfield? I, I, uh, B- uh, Benson Corr in the six, um, uh, Lucelso in the Kulisowski. eight, and Kulisowski yeah. in the ten. Yeah. yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's a good team. It's very There's good four team. more days for Spurs not to get any more injuries in that time. So, who knows? You know, let's keep our fingers crossed. Uh, but but you know, the, the the bench isn't strong. We've got nothing coming off the bench. Um, so it's going to be have to be the, fo- the the eleven on the pitch. And and if we do incur any more injuries, then the whole balance of the team could be upset, depending upon who it is. But keep our fingers crossed. Touch wood, and we can go there. Van der Ven will get through 90 minutes. Benton Cool will get through 90 minutes. You know, there's so much mm. jeopardy with, you know, Werner's think? coming in. Can he get through 90 minutes? There's a lot that can go wrong. There we is assume a hell that of Van der Ven's going to start, right? He, he'll start. He's there, to. There, there, there's a hell of a lot that can go I, wrong. I probably but don't see Benton Cool getting through 90. Um, he got through 80 the other day. Um, th- there is a lot yeah. that can go wrong. The, you know, this is a team that's coming together really sort of from bits and parts. Well, they, and they have been for a few months now and they, st- and they still get through it. But this is a biggest test for a while certainly away from home yeah and and, and, and with a number of returning players and so on it, and, and, and literally nothing's come off the bench that can that can help us so um you know it, it, it's going to be seat of the pants is that the phrase um yeah. uh um, you know a, a, a lot of the time <laughs> we're, we're going to be on a bit of a wing and a prayer through this game but if we can get through it without injuries and incident then i think we have more than enough to beat them if you want my prediction, I'm going to come. To, I'm going to do it in order. Marky okay. Mark prediction. Well, the United have scored 22 goals. This yeah, it's season. their lowest. We've scored 42. That's nearly mm. double. That's mass for you. It's their lowest at this stage in Premier League history. I think. I now think we're definitely going to win. Score. Um, my old favourite, the Ange Classic, three one. Yeah, three mm. one. Gary Diamond. I feel as though it is. Spurs three, United two, but we'll take one point with the ref being three all. <laughs> I'm going to predict two all, but I think United sneak a dodgy two one late on. How does that work? <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, because I'm going to say two all. They nick a dodgy three two with a dodgy. Like no, but I, hold on. No, so, but so you've got two. So you're having two oh, goes. Yeah. You're having yeah. Two bites. I'm in cherry. charge. <laughs> okay. I'm in charge. To be fair, I had two bites. I went because I'm. You know, I don't. With the refs, yeah, but you didn't try and cover it up. No, no, I was out there with it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to predict this, but this will also happen. Yeah, fair, fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. Sneaky. Very good. Do you want to come back on next and week? <laughs> well, we've covered depends the spectrum the, here. Depends we've... what the score is on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> I just think we've been to Old Trafford, as you said, and we've been done so many times. Oh, do you know the one we haven't even mentioned? What? Mendes. Yeah, that was the anniversary of that last yeah. week. Mm. Oh, was that that game? Speaking of games that we were at, were you there? Were no, you there? No, I, was I there. remember you phoned me after I was and there. asked me what you like. You know what, what happened? I'll tell you what, I came out of the ground, right? And this is what I know what happened because we could see it, right? Mm. We could, re- we all went up in the, that, that, little, that corner there. Right? I think you asked right. me because you were like, what they saying? Yeah, it was yeah. our end. What annoyed me, right? Was I came out of the ground and United fans going, something along the lines of they should have had a penalty from a free kick. They thought it was handball, which came 30 seconds after the goal. And I got into it and I was like, 
that free kick should have been a kickoff. What are you talking about? Yeah. You know, but that was just, and that cost us Europe, by the way. Where are we now? Not in Europe. <laughs> uh, <laughs> nor are they. No, the, are they? The game to the. God, my memory's gone. It's only a few weeks ago. Did they? They finished third. No, they finished bottom. No, they finished bottom. Finished bottom yeah, like Newcastle, of course they did. They were Newcastle. Yeah. yeah, screwing up the coefficient right, so to prevent us getting into Europe through fifth. Thanks. You know, so, so, so just finish fourth. Yeah, exactly. That's oh. why we've got to win. So we then have. Do we have a mini break? Yeah, a mini break for a week. But we'll be next back next week. We'll find something to talk about. Um, and maths. then we've got then we've got maths, <laughs> <laughs> and then we've got City uh, in the cup at home. And then Brentford at home in, in the league. So we'll see. But we start with Sunday. Hopefully we get through that unscathed. Gentlemen, thank you. Jake, Marky Mark, thank you. <laughs> Gary, next week you've got to come with some merch, mate, because we're all merched up and you're not. Tooled up. <laughs> Tooled up, like me at Watford away. <laughs> <laughs> what a lovely way to bring it right back round. Uh, gentlemen, oh, see you next week. And uh, get some merch and up the spurs. <laughs>